look at Genesis chapter 7. Lord willing, we'll get from Genesis chapter 7 through chapter 8 because it goes together into one complete section. Having uh, pain, uh, very carefully gone through first six chapters of Genesis, looking last time, uh, two weeks ago now, having last week a uh, guest speaker in, two weeks ago we looked at the whole issue of the flood and the ark and how it became a picture of salvation. It was covered with pitch on the inside and on the out. There's three different levels. As John says, there's three different levels of a Christian man. He's, a, he's an infant, he's a young man, and he's a father in the faith. And we fought, saw many parallels in those passages. I'd encourage you to look at those once again. But this evening, Genesis chapter 7. And as you're there, we'll go ahead and pray. God, I come and once again need your grace. I need your power. I pray, God, that your hand would come upon me and you'd guard me and guide me. I pray, Lord, that these things that we speak about here tonight would be meaningful and they'd cut into the heart and they would have the effect of cleansing us and washing us, Lord. So, God, I pray for this grace. I pray, God, for the filling of your spirit. I pray, God, for wisdom and your power and your grace to come upon us. We pray for this in Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. In chapter 6, we found that Noah, of course, was a righteous man. And the reason that he was righteous, as chapter 6, verse 22, closes by saying Noah did this, he did all that the Lord had commanded him to do. In other words, the righteousness was displayed within a conduct towards God known as faithfulness or obedience unto God. And so chapter 7 opens with the continuation of the story, having God given information about how big and how exactly to build the ark. He then says in chapter 7, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take this with you, seven pairs of clean animals, male and female in his mate, a pair of animals that are not clean, a male and his mate, seven pairs of birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on all the face of the earth. So God begins giving the instruction, and the instruction, first of all, is preceded by the statement that he is a righteous man. And again, as we already alluded to, the reason he was a righteous man is because he did what God told him to do. So when you look within the scripture itself, righteousness is not a passive degree. And I think sometimes today when we think about what righteousness is, we think of it as being passive or non-active. But righteousness in every sense is an active obedience. And that's why it says, for I have seen that you are righteous. And the question would be is, why in the world or how would God eventually see that he was righteous? Only one way, chapter 6, verse 22. He did everything that God had commanded him to do. So righteousness is never a passive or an informal or something that is simply imputed to us. This is why we get confused because Paul speaks in Romans chapter 5 about the imputed righteousness. But righteousness itself is activity. So when God imputes to us righteousness through the vicarious suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he imputes that righteousness, what God is saying is, I'm declaring you did what was right even though you didn't. You did right. Jesus did right, and I took everything, the perfection of who Jesus is, and I put it upon you, and I impute his righteousness unto you. So, but we confuse, though, that imputed righteousness is all that we have. We are imputed righteous so that we can be righteous. And righteousness in the mind of the Hebrew, in the mind of the scripture itself, was sarik. It was giving. It was acting. It was behaving. It's right conduct. And God looked at Noah, this righteous man, who he gave the command to do certain activities that seem absolutely worthless to build a system that, for a condition that does not yet exist upon the earth, to build an ark for a thing that does not and has not ever appeared upon the earth, a flood. He did what God told him to do in costly obedience to himself, by faith, not really understanding why or what God, in fact, was having him do, and he did the work, and God looks at him, and he says, I have seen that you are righteous. And in the exact same way, God might come to us and say, hey, Ben, I want you to do this. And you have this impress upon your heart, I think I need to do this. Sometimes folks will come to me and they'll say, well, Ben, I, I feel like God's telling me to do something. And then they'll describe the thing that they think God's telling them to do, and it's very costly to them, and it would be irrational and illogical if you think it through. It's costing me something, a significant amount of sacrifice to obey the Lord. I think God's telling me to do this. And they said, but then again, it might be my own flesh. 
And I tell him, I said, trust me, your flesh doesn't want to sacrifice anything of itself towards God ever under any conditions. So the very fact that God begins to say, hey, I want you to do this, that was because he looked at me and says, I believe that he's a man who will obey me. And when I obeyed, God saw that it was righteous. And you know what I think of when I read this? In Matthew chapter 6, it says, when you do your works, do them before your Father in heaven and your Father who sees in secret. Even though most men will never even see what you've done. Most men will never acknowledge. But when we have that secret place between us and God, some things that we do for God cannot but be helped be seen by other people. It's not the fact that you're seen or not seen before other people. It's the heart behind it that I don't want to be seen. I, I want to be seen by my Father in heaven. I'm doing what I'm doing to please him, to honor him. And what he says is God looked at him. And I think the danger that we have, and I was talking with some guys about this here today, so much of what we do upon the earth is out of the fear of the reputation that other men can say or do to us or think about us. And there's that freedom from that where you begin to say, God, I'm going to do what I'm going to do to please you. And again, it's the audience of one. And as we do what we do before him, we please him. God, am I right in your sight? I want to be right with you and wrong with the world if I had to pick one or the other. And so he was righteous. I have seen that you are righteous, Noah. In this generation, this great context where evil is pervading upon the land, where each man is doing right in his own eyes, to borrow the words of the judges, they're doing wicked and lascivious things. In this context, you're doing right. And what the Bible reveals to us is that there's great opportunity to do good in the days of evil. Redeem the time, the Bible says, for the days are evil. In other words, the context of the wicked days in which we live are wicked days, and you can melt away in them, or you can look at it through God and say, this very context of the evil around me is the basis for me to do good within the context of that wickedness. Redeem the time, the days are evil. And the whole idea behind that verbiage is there's a relationship between the opportunity to behave towards God and the conditions of the rebellions that are taking place upon the earth. And I have seen that you're righteous in this generation, this wicked place that we're at. It provides the context and the opportunity to be different. I mean, what if everyone was just, you know, never did anything wrong? And I've called a man, a woman, to in a context of a self-seeking generation to live differently, obediently, sacrificially unto my glory. So he says, take with you seven pairs of clean animals. And then he says, one pair of each male and female of unclean animals. The clean animals were animals they could eat and or offer a sacrifice before the Lord. The unclean animals they could not. And so why in the world did he have seven pairs of unclean anim of clean animals? Excuse me, Because the simple reason, yes, of course, seven is the number of perfection. The clean animals are a symbol of perfection. There's, there's the perfection of holiness. The Bible talks about the beauty of holiness, cleanliness. Seven, perfection, the perfection of the holiness of God in what he wants to partake of on this earth. But also from the simple practical reason that you don't want to just have one male sheep and, or, or uh, you know, boy and girl of the sheep. What do you call them? I don't know what you call them. Does anyone know what they call them? You don't want it just a boy and a, a girl. Because if one of them dies, you wipe out the whole race. So you want to perpetuate upon the earth the clean animals and those that are good to eat and to partake of. And so he gives them practical expression, but a simple reality, the perfection of holiness, the perfection of cleanliness, the beauty of holiness. This is what I want you to partake of. This is what I want you to prepare for in this new generation that I'm going to take you into. I'm going to wipe out this present earth, all the things that are upon it. I'm going to baptize it with water and cleanse it, wash it down, and I'm going to bring you out of it, Noah, with the perfection of holiness. And then he says in verse 4, For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. I think I heard a kid once say that, you know, if you don't know the answer in the Bible, just say 12 or 40. You know, <laughs> chances are you'll probably get it. But what do we find with the number 40? 40 is a picture that we see certainly in the scripture itself. The children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. It tells us our Lord was tempted of the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights. Here it tells us the judgment of God is going to come upon the earth in 40 days and in 40 nights. So what do we make of this term 40? 40 becomes a time of God's judgment 
and trial in the midst of that judgment. A time of God's judgment and trial within the judgment. And so I will send rain, my judgment upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Because I'm grieving over all that I have made. And sometimes people will look at a passage like this and say, well, that's not very fair. You're going to wipe out everything upon the earth. Note those words. I underlined it here. All that I have made. It's my stuff. I belong. It belongs to me. All of it. Everything that they're twisting and manipulating. And in order to save Noah so he doesn't become wicked like them, I'm going to pull him out because it's not going to get any better. God knows. And then he wipes out the entire earth. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. And again, we can't but help note the repetition of the obedience of Noah in every in any situation. And then it continues in verse 6 by saying, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went with him into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps upon the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with God as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the water of the flood came upon the earth. So God ordains the animals. They're coming in two by two into the ark, seven pairs of clean animals. And God moves upon the hearts of these animals. And you think, how in the world can he do that? How can the emperor penguins do what they do? How can birds know and navigate themselves halfway across the world when their mother has already left them and they're born upon the girth and then they fly and find their mom and dad? I mean, all these migration, I was reading these stories today. I wasn't going to repeat them here this evening. But all these migration stories of animals instinctively knowing how to get from one place to another. Who put that in them? It's the miracle of God's creation. These animals just instinctively know. And so God, in some measure or another, brought these animals to Noah. And they come into the ark, and he says, I'm going to place them upon the earth. And what we found in earlier in our studies in the book of 1 Peter in chapter 3, Peter records to us what this ark, in fact, represents. In 1 Peter 3.18, he tells us, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in the prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. And then he describes what the days of Noah were like. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And then he goes on. So what says Peter? He says, even as Noah was building an ark in this perverse generation, so it is that we have an ark, we have salvation that we enter into, and by entering into Christ, that salvation, going into that ark, we are preserved upon the earth. And what we saw in our earlier studies is that this ark that he built wasn't like the pictures that you see in children's picture books or modern movies with a nice hole made for being seaworthy, it was a coffin. It was a box. It was a place that looked like a place of death. It was the same wood that was used for the wood of coffins. And there it was, make this coffin and put pitch on the inside and on the out. And what we found is that word for pitch was the same word used throughout the entire Old Testament in every other situation for being atonement. Put the atonement. What is the atonement? The blood of Jesus. Put it on the inside. Put it on the outside. Completely cover it. And this will become the vehicle of use that will preserve you, the ark that will preserve you. And put it upon three levels. My little children, John says, you know your sins have been forgiven. Young men, you've overcome the evil one. Fathers, they're mature and they can teach others. And so what we find is that there's these grades. There's many rooms within the ark. All sorts of capacities, different denominations, different groups of people with different variances and, and minor details. We don't major on the minors. There's all sorts of spaces to exist upon this ark. And there's a covering. There's a window to heaven. The door is shut. It's locking you in. But the, the window is to heaven. Not only to get the smells out, but to keep our focus upon the Lord. It says a skylight. Put that there. 
So it would act like a chimney in a sense, pumping bad smells out and good smells in, but also keep your eyes. And when we begin to be those ones who would come into the ark, we would be ones who would be men of prayer. And it's a way and a vehicle to get the bad odors out and the good odor in, to keep the air fresh, the breath fresh, the spirit. And as we kept our eyes upon the Lord, it becomes the focus, the vehicle, while we're just floating, surviving the chaos of the seas of God's judgment, which is a picture of the wickedness upon the earth and the way God was going to deal with it, being set apart and preserved from this. It tells us in the passage, he stayed in the, the ark for seven days. The waters of the flood came upon the earth. Now, how do we know this word seven? Again, you say it's perfection, and certainly it is. But later on, we find in the book of Revelation that the church is either caught out of the tribulation or goes safely through the tribulation. Those who hold to a pre-tribulational rapture theory would say that I'm caught out. This is proof of it. Noah is there and he's taken out of the judgment, and those who hold to a post-tribulation would hold the point of view. They're saying, look, no, he's preserved within the judgment. I don't care which one you are. I really don't. And if you think that's the major issue on Scripture, I think you're missing a few things. But rather, it shows God's care and protection in the midst of the trial, that I'm going to preserve you upon the earth, that there is a day coming upon the earth that is going to destroy mankind. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, this is going to happen, not with water, but with fire. He said the present heavens and the present earth are reserved for judgment. But if this is true, that God would preserve a righteous man who acted upon earth towards God, he's been imputed righteousness in Christ. The atonement has covered him. But now that he's imputed, he acts it out in obedience towards God. And this one would be preserved upon the earth in the day of trial. The very thing that he thought was going to be a loss to himself. Spent 120 years of my time, energy, and money building an ark. The very thing he thought would be a loss was the very vehicle of salvation in the day of judgment. In the same regard, I don't think that any man is going to be sad that he committed himself to the Lord in the day of judgment. I imagine the 120 years that he was laboring, he'd sit back and say, boy, this is a lot of sacrifice and giving. But at the day of judgment, he said, praise God, I prepared not that we can do anything for our salvation, but he was behaving according to the directives of God. And God has given directives. We don't create our own directives. We simply walk within them. And so he takes them in. He puts them within the ark for seven days until a flood came upon the earth. And it says in verse 11, the 600th year of Noah's life, and the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heaven were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah his wife, and the three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark. And they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded them, and the Lord had shut them in. And what says this? Let me tell you, and as an aside of a scientific note, many people say, well, this is ridiculous. It's going to rain all this time, and if you could rain that long for 100 years, it wouldn't produce that much water. And I said, that's not what the Bible says. Yes, the heavens did break forth, but what it says is the deeps broke forth. The primary source of flooding was from underground, not from the sky. And he tells us God prepared them. He takes them in and covers them, protects them, shields them from the coming judgment. And the Lord shut him in. And you know what this is a picture of? This is a picture, as I see it, of man repenting. Man turns away from the world system, from the world way of doing things, and he obeys the call of God, and he goes into Jesus Christ. He yields himself, and God comes and closes him in. He makes it secure so that the only way Noah could have gotten off the ark is if he chose to jump ship. People can choose to jump ship. They're fools. But there's nothing that God's going to do to try to make you jump the ship. He's going to do everything to keep you in. And he shuts it in. He closes it in. And seals the man. Noah had to repent. Change his mind. I'm going to say no to the things of this world. 
and I'm going to turn and say yes unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And he turns and goes into the ark, the very thing that he had to do was separate from the world in order to be the man that God would call him to be. And so the first thing I see is repentance. And then the flood continued in verse 17, 40 days upon the earth. And the water increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, and swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals, creeping things, and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark, and all the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. One of the things you'll find within the histories of mankind, virtually every ancient civilization talks about a flood that happened upon the earth. You find it in the Chinese arts, the Hawaiian histories, by the way, uh, Babylonian histories. The Babylonians talk about uh, the sacrifices that were taking place at the end. Of course, in their mind, the sacrifice taking place at the uh, time of the flood with the Noah figure that survived the flood was because the gods were really hungry because nobody was around to feed them during the whole time of the flood. And so finally the flood gets happened, so they offer the sacrifices and they eat it all up and they're like, oh, that was good, you know, type of thing. Yeah, but all these cultures have these variations of the same account saying there was a worldwide flood upon the earth and some group, a family of men, eight souls in all, were saved and preserved. And you know why I think that is carried out through the histories of mankind? Because it happened. When you look at the fossil record, the only explanation for it is a flood. I've never seen a, a deer hit on the side of the road and over thousands of years, dust slowly building up around it and encasing it. The fossil record is evidence of mud, and you don't have mud without water. So you can only have the fossil record with water and mud instantly encasing something. When you find these boneyards across the, the, the world, really, or shark's teeth in fields in Nebraska, you have these proofs within the earth of not evolution taking place over millions of years, but a catastrophic event coming upon the earth. The deeps broke forth, shaped the mountains, moved them around, you have bone yards at the tops of mountains with a whole varieties of bones from various animals all collected together. Why? Because as the waters tells us in chapter 8, they were assuaging, the King James says. That is, it was the idea that there was tidal pools that would swirl around and stop and move around from here to there. It was absolute chaos going upon the earth. So when you see Noah landing upon the Mount Ararat, he doesn't get out for a while. Why? Because it was very, very, very scary. And everything was dead. Can you see the corpses floating all over? Can you smell it? Can you imagine the horror? Can you imagine the, 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 the humility that would have entered into Noah when he recognized that all these people I've been preaching to are now dead and eternally in hell? Now, some people think that this flood was somehow a local flood. Well, if it was a local flood, why, didn't God, why did God tell him to build an ark for 120 years? I would say, Noah, there's a local flood that's coming. So I want you to walk down to Africa, out on the south tip, and stay there for a little bit. It would take a few days. It would have been a lot more convenient than spending 120 years in building an ark. And then other people say, well, it was a local flood because, you know, just you see in Texas, for instance, you have floods going around, and, and this is proof in and of itself that you have a local flood. The problem was that the text says that the mountains were covered. The mountain tops were covered by 15 cubits. A cubit is a foot and a half. So what is that? You know, whatever that number is, 20-some feet, 24 feet going up, and it's completely covered, completely buried, Twice the, the height of this room right there. That's probably 12-foot ceiling, I'm guessing. It's going the highest of the mountain, Mount Everest, covered up by 24 feet. And if it was a local flood, you couldn't cover up a mountain. The water always finds the lowest spot. And so what we find is that exactly what the scriptures have said. 
the only reason we can explain the fossil record and the strata that are seen is you drive out on Highway 200. What do you see there? You see the strata. What is that a consequence of? They tell me, the geologists tell me that's one of the greatest uh, geological sites in the whole United States, right there. Right there you have evidences of a catastrophic event, the strata being protruded upward, something forced it upward. And they talk about glaciers. Well, where did the glaciers come from? They came from a massive movement from underneath water and the earth moving and spinning, freezing in some parts and heating in others. It was imbalanced. Something happened upon the earth. And later on at the end of chapter 8, when it t tells God, when God says, I'll never do this again, he goes on to say, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. What does this mean? In other words, something happened with the rotation of the earth in order to create the dynamic where waters would have been moving and breaking forth upon the earth. Suddenly this earth that was spinning. So because he now promises that it will continue to spin because we do understand that the spinning of the earth creates the seed time, the harvest, the winter, the summer, cold and heat, right? You spin around the sun. And as we spin, it creates day and night. So it would appear because this promise was correlated to the promise not to flood again. The basis of the flooding seems to be that instantly the earth came to a halt. And something radical happened. A jerking, a jolting. The waters break forth. And God allowed the distribution of those waters rather quickly as a consequence thereof. And so here he is upon the earth. And then the lessons I think, begin to play out here in chapter 8. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heaven was restrained. And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of the 150 days, the waters had abated and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. What has just happened upon the earth? A cataclysm, a flood, destruction everywhere. But then it tells us the wind blew upon the waters. And friends, do you know something about that? Does that sound at all remotely familiar? A great judgment comes upon the earth, but then the Spirit of God came upon the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the wind, the ruach, was hovering over the face of the waters. And now here God judges the earth, and what does it say? God made a wind blowing over the earth, and the waters subsided. The pictures are startling. And he says the fountains dried up. Some type of force was injected into the environment to create a cessation of the springing forth. So the wells today that we have were capped off. So we have to dig for them. The waters receded into the oceans that we see today. And it says the waters abated. This is interesting in verse 4. A very important point. Verse 4, the waters ceased in the seventh month of the 17th day of the month. The ark came to rest. In other words, the judgment stopped. Hear this. The judgment stopped at a particular time. The seventh month on the 17th day of the month. Now, does that mean anything to you? In Exodus chapter 12, we're told that the giving of the Passover in Exodus 12, that God changed the seventh month to the first month. In Exodus chapter 12. He made the Passover the beginning of the year, though previously the beginning of the year had come in the fall. So on the 14th day of the first month, which was formerly the seventh month, the Passover was to be eaten. And we know from the Gospels that the day of Passover was eaten when our Lord died in Jerusalem. Three days after the Lord died on the 14th, that would bring us to the 17th. And on the 17th day of the first month, three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. 
And that would be the same as the 17th day of the seventh month and the old reckoning, the old calendar given to us in the book of Genesis. And so it's most significant that the ark grounded upon the mountains of Ararat on the same calendar day that our Lord rose from the dead. And in this, he's signifying that the life in the new earth for God's people was to rest upon resurrection power. You've survived. You've gone into the ark. The way that you're now to enter into this new age, this new time period that I'm creating upon the earth, you're to enter it on the 17th day, on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. You are to come into it in resurrection power. And I don't think we would possibly be, have any clearer picture than the portrayal of the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ than this. And so what happened was, is that first, Noah, you must come into the ark to repent, to turn away from this world and come into me where I provide an atonement, a covering, that'll be a safeguard. It'll be your death. It'll be a coffin box, but it's the only way to come alive, to preserve the judgment that's coming. But secondly, when those waters come, according to 1 Peter 3, they will be a baptism. And the waters that are intended to destroy the earth will actually cleanse the earth And because you are in the ark, those waters that destroy others will actually preserve and save you. It'll be repentance. It'll be cleansing. And you'll enter into the new earth with resurrection power. And so he says in verse 6, at the end of the 40 days of Noah, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. And then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the earth to the the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf, so Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And now here he is. He's entering into the new life. He came into the ark, salvation. He's preserved through the judgment of God. He comes into the new earth on Mount Ararat. He rested in the resurrection life. And the first thing he does is release two birds. The first bird was a raven, the text tells us, an unclean bird, according to Leviticus. The second bird was a dove, a clean bird, according to the book of Leviticus. And what did the raven do? The raven went out, and it did not return. The raven goes out, and what do you think a raven does? It eats anything. It eats roadkill, anything that it can eat. Do you think it found something delicious to eat? Do you think there was a few animals floating around? He releases the unclean bird and it goes out and undoubtedly finds a place to land because it didn't return. And the only place it could land, I would suggest, was on the carrion, the diseased animals, the dead bodies that were lying all over. It began to devour it and to eat it. It found a place to rest its foot. But when he released the clean animal, the dove, it went around and it found no place to put its foot. A dove will not eat a dead deer. And it returned back to Noah. And why is this important? Because as I come into that resurrection life, essentially, I have, well, some people say two me's. I have only one me, actually. But there's two persons. There's not a good me and a bad me. There's a bad me. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can understand it? And then there's the impartation of the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul talks about this in Galatians 5, saying that there's the flesh, the real me, and then there's the spirit of God, that's God. And he comes to live inside of a man. And as soon as God invades humanity of man and lives and works his life into the man so he's living in resurrection power, immediately we find there's a conflict. Because my flesh always wants to eat the things of the flesh. The flesh is always looking for a good dig, some good flesh to eat upon to bait itself with. And yet the Spirit of God, represented by the Holy Spirit, is also set forth, and it tells it that he had no place to set his foot. The Spirit of God didn't find anything of this earth satisfying to its appetite. 
And so he did only one thing. The Spirit of God came back to Noah, back to the righteous man. And Noah is seen standing there with his arms stretched forth, reaching out consistently in the Bible. The dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus is baptized in Matthew chapter 3, it says he goes down into the water and John sees the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus like a dove. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then I saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove. What we find is that a man must be like a lamb if he wants the Spirit to come upon him. And there is Noah a man who is obedient to our Lord, and he's standing in this newly judged earth, walking in salvation and in the resurrection power, interacting with the new world that has been just cleansed from the flood by the Spirit of God and by his flesh, the very thing you and I struggle with. But here, what he wanted was not the raven. He wanted the Spirit of God, and this becomes a picture of a man that his relationship to God must be first and foremost. It's intentional. He's saying, I want you. And there's a sense that we have to reach out and take the grace of God. I want it. And he offers it, and he yearns for it. He's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I want it. I want the dove. And when the dove finally comes back to him, it tells us it's holding an olive leaf in its mouth, and this universally has become a picture of peace. And how is a man going to have peace? Not by satisfying, I think all of us know what this is like. Not by satisfying the lusts of the raven nature, the unclean bird, looking for flesh to devour. But there's going to be peace when we receive and yearn for the Spirit of God, knowing that that fleshly nature will always be there. But I want to walk in the Spirit. And he sent forth, and he came back with peace, the olive leaf. And by this, Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And he waited, the text says in verse 12, another seven days and set forth the dove and she didn't return to him anymore. And in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, another important date, the waters were dried from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Now, what is this? We also know in the scriptures itself that the number six is the number of man. We think about the last days. It talks in Revelation 13 of the mark of the beast is going to be 666. It's a picture of the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. Man enthroned, I am God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I am God. It's about me. I'm the arbiter of truth. What I like is true. What I don't like is false. And here man is enthroned. He's exalting himself. And so in the scripture, you see that six was the number of man. What does it tell us? That here was Noah, who, although in the flesh, although being a man, he was yielded unto God. He entered into the ark in his sixth generation the number six the number of his humanity but when he encounters the new earth in the same way that i would encounter the new heaven and the new earth when he encounters the new earth it's the first year in the first month of the first day of the month the 601st year in other words it's the very beginnings of the seventh century of his life This literally happened, but it happened this way so that man could learn a lesson. That his life upon the earth was to be encountered now, having gone into the ark, being preserved from judgment, living in the resurrection power, and reaching for the Spirit of God. His life upon the earth was to be a man of no longer the old man, no longer, as Paul says, behold, in Christ all things are new. The old has gone, the new has come. We put on Christ We're a new creature in Jesus. And it says that we enter in into newness. And we come into that relationship with him where he now is the perfection. It's the picture here of the new beginning. That we're to come into this new relationship. The new dynamic that's going to be upon the earth. And this is what took place. This is what the scripture recorded. Historically, that's exactly what happened. But we understand from 1 Corinthians 10 there was a message being laid forth. And then it says in verse 14, and in the second month on the 27th day of the month, 
the earth dried out. And God said to Noah, go out from the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives. What did God say at the beginning? He says, go into the ark. I think in the book of Revelation where he opens in chapter 4, he says, come up here. (laughs) And now he's saying, go out. Go out of the ark, you and your wives. And so what we see is Noah not doing what he's going to do when he thinks it's practical or reasonable, but just simply doing and obeying according to the command and the beck and the call of God. So says the text in verse 17, Bring out with you every living thing that is all the flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may swarm upon the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. And then in verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of the clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offering upon the altar. How did Noah engage the new earth? How was he going to relate himself to this new world that he finds himself in? Not without blood. Adam and Eve sinned and were taken out of the garden. Cain and Abel come to the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Cain offers the work of his hands trying to conquer the curse of God, the thorns and the thistles. Abel models God who took lambskins and clothed the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Abel models that and he approached God, as we would say, from the law, not without blood. And now the first encounter after man going through trial and judgment, now the sin of men reaching its full and the judgment of God falling upon the earth. Noah, a righteous man, the first thing he does is encounter this new earth, not without blood. I imagine Noah was hungry. I imagine he probably had appetites, but he recognized there was something in the blood and the offering of the sacrifice, according to Leviticus 1, the blood was to be taken and it was to be splashed against the side of the altar. What is the altar? The scriptures reveal to us the altar is the place of judgment. God, let your blood cover the place of judgment. He came out of the judgment. The wrath of God had been revealed to him. God sprinkled the blood. He pours it against the altar, splashes it. And then it tells us specifically that it was the burnt offering. And the burnt offering is what Paul was referring to in Romans 12 when he said, offer your body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. The burnt offering, the book of Leviticus opens by saying, take that burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Because it's the whole body, but present the whole body in its parts. As they say in math, the whole is the sum of the parts. The hand, the fingers, the arm, the elbow, all of them together are the body. So recognize in the burnt offering the totality of the body, put it as a burnt offering upon the Lord, and it was our way of saying, God, I'm completely giving my life to you. How do we approach God? Number one, he says, first of all, come with a sin offering when he was ordaining the priests. You have to deal with your sin, the blood of Jesus. Romans chapter 1 through 11, you have to deal with your sin offering, the Lord Jesus Christ. But because the sin offering, the next consecrating offering given by the priest was the burnt offering. This is your reasonable sacrifice. Because of the sin offering, the Lamb of God, Jesus, has taken away your sin. Here's the only rational, logical conclusion. Offer yourself as a burnt offering. The whole chunk, your hands, your fingers, your eyes, your tongue, your nose, your ears, your heart, your belly, give it to him. As be completely consumed by the Lord. Exodus goes on to tell us that they had a third offering, which was the peace offering to walk in fellowship with God, the wave offering, the nourishment that was to take place, present your body. And Noah, having been saved out of the wrath of God by the atonement, the pitch that was covered all over, now offers his body as a living sacrifice in the animal, in a picture of what was yet to come. But he took the burnt offering. He baptized the earth with water, God did, He baptized the earth with water, and in this he judged it, but he also cleansed it. Noah, 
the first act of Noah, the righteous man, is he baptizes the earth with blood and he offers himself completely to the Lord. He says, take me, all of me. And he placed the aroma before the Lord. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. What is God saying? He said, I've recognized something here. That man himself will not be corrected simply by judgment. That judgment is my strange work. Judgment is necessary to remove the gangrenous body parts so that the, what's good can remain. And so God does judge. But he says, I'll never judge like this again. Why? Because he recognized that man's heart is evil. And man's heart isn't going to be changed by judgment. And what we understand when we look at the new covenant is that he comes and he promises in Ezekiel that I'll write the law upon their hearts. I'll, as Jeremiah says in 30 and 33, as Ezekiel tells us, I'll take out their stony heart and give them a heart of flesh. A man's heart who is wicked from childbirth will never come by judging him. His heart will only change by the impartation of another's heart. And God puts a new heart within the man. I recognize that all the wrath isn't going to really deal. I had to judge because of the sin has become so pervasive upon the earth. I had to put an end to it. But if I want men's hearts to change, something else needs to take place. And I'm never going to curse the ground because, again, like this, because of man's sin. Because the issue within man, God says, is the heart. It's evil. It's corrupt. And his heart must be changed. And neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I've done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And again, in some way or another, this earth that was out of kilt was related directly to the judgment that was going to happen upon the earth. You know, Peter talks about this very thing in the book of Second Peter in chapter 3. He tells us, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind as a way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through our, your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since our fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. But Peter says, for they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And by that means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. When we might ask at the time of Noah, the earth was flooded with water, says Peter. But verse seven, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment, the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, the one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow and fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. And since all these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to the, his promise, we are waiting for the new heaven and the new earth, just like Noah, in which righteousness dwells and this becomes the hope of the christian god you came upon the earth you called this man noah to repent and he did he came into the ark 
You, the waters, cleansed the earth, but judged the earth. But the very waters that judged the earth also preserved him and lifted him up out of the earth. And when he came to rest on the very same day that Jesus rose from the dead, he entered into the new earth. And the first thing he does when he entered into the new earth, this day of new beginnings, he goes out of the ark at the command of God, not his own idea, and he offers up sacrifice. And watching the earth that was baptized with water, now he baptizes it with blood because the scripture tells us later, not without blood. And then he offers his entire self, the burnt offering, and God said, that's what I want. I want man to be completely set apart to me. It's sweet aroma to me. It's a blessing unto me. And I'll never again curse the ground like this because the way to deal with that is the heart of man. I had to judge the earth because of the wickedness, but I never will again. I will change the heart of man. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this and to take and to walk in the good of it. I thank you for Noah and I thank you for the pictures that are replete in the scripture of what you've done and what you will do. Keep us, Lord. Let us walk in the good of this word and be better men and women for it. We pray for this grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.